Well, we've been waiting almost two years for this day, a trial that just might answer the question, why did Stephen Harper's closest advisor secretly slip Mike Duffy $90,000 to pay off his questionable Senate expenses? The political world came to a standstill today as Duffy, the former reporter, now suspended senator, walked into the courtroom to face 31 charges of fraud, breach of trust and bribery. Jennifer Ditchburn from the Ottawa Bureau of Canadian Press was in the room while Andrew and Bruce were following all the action online. Chantel, by the way, is away this week. Jennifer, you start us off. What was it, uh, what was it like in there? Well, you know, you sort of brace yourself for things to be not as interesting as you hope. You know, oh, well, it's probably not going to be that great. But actually, it was really, really interesting. The courtroom's quite small, and um, it was very, very quiet. I, mean, I think everyone in there, and there were mostly reporters, but there were some members of the public just hung on every word. And um, Mr. Duffy was there with um, some of his supporters, his wife, for example, and he, he tapped away at a computer. He was taking notes. I guess that's the, the former journalist in him. Um, but really, the two lawyers, uh, they, they were giving their opening statements, and there was a lot of drama in their statements. There was a, one moment, for example, when Donald Bain, who's Mr. Duffy's lawyer, um, he picked up a, a, a binder about that big of emails, which we haven't seen yet. I, I totally want to see those emails. And he sort of threw them on the table. So it made a, a loud thump, and I think that was r really for effect, so that we can all know that that's the the tip of we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of, of evidence so far um, that they want to show us. Uh, so you know, as far as um, you know, what we might have anticipated, I think we got a lot out of today. There was a lot of detail, and as, as I said, a lot of drama in what they were the story that they were telling us. All right. Well, you're right. There are so many little things that were hinted at that we we didn't get to see or hear today, and we're all anxious to hear them. But of, of what we did hear, uh, Andrew, was there anything new in what we heard? Other than the odd titillating detail, I wouldn't say so. I think what we learned, if you will, today was how quickly this is going to expand out from just the misdeeds alleged or otherwise of one senator uh, into a broader sort of cultural and political question. I mean, Mr. Duffy's defense, as I understand it, is that he was just following disorder that there were no rules or that they were they were unclear or they weren't enforced and he was just kind of inserting himself in that culture and doing as others had done I think even by the standards of the Senate, uh, if there are such things, um, certainly what he's accused of doing goes beyond that. But he can certainly argue, look, uh, you know, I was appointed to do certain jobs. I was sent around the country at public expense to raise funds for the party. It's a bit much for them to be turning on me now, which obviously makes life just uncomfortable for the government. It also points to this larger culture of why we appoint senators in the first place and the kinds of rules and, or lack of rules and senators that have accumulated over the years in that place. Bruce? Well, I was struck by a few things. First of all, Peter, uh, it was obviously a bad day for uh, Mr. Duffy. It was a reminder that this wasn't just one bad decision or one questionable decision this was made. This was dozens of decisions that were made about expense claims that to the average uh, citizen might not look like they uh, they hold up to much scrutiny. Uh, but I think it was also a reminder of how difficult a situation this is for the government, that even though in the House of Commons on some days the government felt like it was giving almost as good as it was getting in terms of the exchange with the opposition parties, there is no win for the government in the way that this trial is going to play itself out. And by that, I really mean that even if, and it's an important if, their story, their basic story remains intact throughout this trial, it's still a pretty ugly story in terms of the way in which the government managed this a whole situation, who said what to whom and when. And there remain some uh, important gray areas in terms of the spirit of what the prime minister said he did and knew and, and acted on and, uh, and what may come out in this trial, at least based on the early statements today. Well, one of those gray areas, as you point out, is, is what the Prime Minister knew and when he knew it, that old you know, Watergate phrase. Uh, but let's face it, that's why so many people are sitting in that courtroom every day, uh, going to be monitoring this. Jennifer, one of the things that came out today from the uh, defense lawyer, Bain, uh, was some, uh, uh, some reflection on the comments that uh, Nigel Wright made to the RCMP in that yes. interview mm -hmm. uh, and and people are leaping on some of what was uh, what was said there what of particular interest was it that you found in that well that see this is what I mean by the, the stuff that we haven't seen in the tip of the iceberg as Mr. Bain put it so we've seen um, 
small parts of the RCMP's transcript of their interview with Mr. Wright. But Mr. Bain read out a part that we had never heard about before. Um, and that's where he, he quotes Mr. Wright as saying to the RCMP that um, he was forcing somebody to repay expenses that they didn't want to repay. And I think it's that word forcing. Where we were sort of all taken aback because it kind of frames the picture in a different way. Uh, we have the Crown saying that Mr. Duffy was behind um, sort of ba basically in extorting the Prime Minister's office. You repay my expenses and I'll, I'll agree to make this all go away. Um, but here we have another frame that says that somebody, the, basically one of the highest people in the Prime Minister's office was forcing someone to do something. I mean, that's a completely different spin and I think that, uh, you know, everybody sort of paused when they heard him read out that transcript. You also seem to suggest that he told the RCMP this is being right, um, that the Prime Minister, that he actually warned the Prime Minister, you know, Duffy may not have done anything wrong here. Uh, that's right. I mean, that, that was another part of that, that particular transcript that was quite interesting, that, you know, Duffy feels that he hasn't done anything wrong. It's possible he hasn't. And that we need to, I need to tell you this, because if somebody else comes forward from our caucus saying that they've done something else, we're also going to have to kick th that person out at some point. We ha might have to threaten to kick that person out. So obviously, among reporters, we're very interesting, interested in seeing the rest of that transcript and the rest of what Mr. Wright said. Um, but I think I, just on what Bruce was saying, um, I think this goes to the sort of the, the, the question that's a politically toxic issue here, which is that um, there, there, there was that culture. Like, why, why did people think it was okay to do some of this stuff, either um, trying to influence a Senate committee's report or an independent audit? And, and force someone, uh, allegedly force someone to do something that they didn't want to do. You're nodding your head there, Andrew. Well, yes and no. The, the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, I, there's lots of tips of lots of icebergs here. They, I think we want to be careful of the context of the emails that were now being read. Uh, what was he, in fact, forced to do? He certainly wasn't forced to pay back the money. In fact, he's not done that to this day. Uh, so at most he was forced to go along with a scheme to make him look less bad than he might otherwise have looked. Forced so to admit I, wrongdoing, I think, is what the, the right. issue is, right? Which even then, I think, when, when they finally did say, I'm, I'm paying back the expenses, which he didn't, he made a claim about, well, I, you, know, I, I, uh, you know, I didn't realize I was, uh, was an error or something like that. He still hasn't really admitted wrongdoing either, and maybe he doesn't need to. We'll see. So I'd be, just be careful about all that, but I certainly agree that the, the, the broader cultural questions, not only the, to explain uh, Mr. Duffy's behavior, but to explain Nigel Wright's behavior, for example, uh, we're faced here with, on the one hand, individual acts and individual choices for which people need to be held to account, but more broadly, what was the set of expectations, what were the explicit instructions, perhaps, uh, we'll find out, that were coming from uh, higher up is also part of this whole puzzle. Yeah, you know, as Jennifer has warned us, uh, we haven't seen those notes from the RCMP yet. Uh, of their conversation with Nigel Wright. But from what we heard today, does any of that contradict what the Prime Minister has said in the past or, or throw up questions about what he may have said? Bruce? It does raise questions about it for sure. And that's been the case with every little tiny bit of information that we've heard about Nigel Wright's version of this story. Nigel Wright, let's remember, is the person who has the most information to share, to shed light on what exactly happened here. And he's somebody from whom we've heard arguably the least. And so we do need to wait for what he has to say. But it's probably a reasonable guess that if he had a great story to tell, first of all, he might not have resigned his position. Um, but certainly, if he had a great story to tell in terms of what it would do for the reputation of the government and the management of this issue, we probably would have heard more of it uh, before now even bearing in mind the challenges associated with getting some information out while there is a, an investigation in progress. Uh, I think it's safe to assume that what Mr. Wright has to say about the conversations that he had with the Prime Minister is not going to feel 100% uh, comfortable for the Prime Minister and for those who've been defending the Prime Minister and say, who in saying, in effect, that as soon as he learned about what had gone on, he took action. And he's really conveying a sense of the spirit of how he governs and how he manages, uh, rather than the specifics of did he do something personally wrong in this area. And I think that remains to be seen, uh, that remains the most interesting uh, untold element of this story. And one of the things he may be able to clear up for us, too, is whether he resigned or whether he was fired, because we've been told both. Uh, by the Prime Minister's office at different times during all this. Aside from Nigel Wright, who obviously everybody wants to hear from, of uh, what you've seen of that witness list, Jennifer, mm -hmm. who are you most interested in hearing from 
other than Nigel Wright? You give me one name anyway. Hmm. Well, I mean, Mike, Mike Duffy, I'm quite interested. And we heard today that he, has, uh, he is actually going to take the stand at some point. Um, but I'm interested that, in hearing from... The defense from, made that clear, did they, that he they, will take the stand? Yes. Uh, his lawyer told reporters that were waiting, uh, waiting for him outside uh, today that, that he was going to take the stand when we don't know. So very interested to hear what he has to say, obviously. But I'm also interested to hear if Chris Montgomery takes the stand. I'll be very interested. He was somebody who worked with uh, Senator Marjorie, Marjorie LeBreton. He was uh, an advisor to her. And if you remember, he was sort of the only figure working inside uh, the upper echelons of the government at the time that said, whoa, I, I don't think what you're doing is right. I don't think we should be meddling in the affairs of a Senate committee. And eventually they sort of wore him down and um, he eventually left government. Uh, or left the Senate at any rate. So I'd be really interested to hear what he has to say as somebody, you know, who, who, who I guess had found some sort of a, um, a, an ethical compass in the middle of all this mess. Andrew, who, you, uh, who do you want to hear from? Again, I'll have to plead ignorance as to exactly whether he's on the witness list or, law or not, but Senator Irving Gerstein, I think, would certainly be an interesting witness for two respects. One is that there was, as you'll recall, before Nigel Wright decided to pay Duffy himself, there was an original plan that the party would repay him. That was eventually kibosh when it turned out to be a much larger amount than they thought. Mr. Gerstein was in the middle of that, but he was also allegedly uh, the, the go-between in terms of, of influencing or allegedly influencing the, uh, the forensic audit. And that's one of the most troubling aspects of this whole case is the lengths to which they were prepared to go for reasons that I think are still a, a puzzle to try to cover the tracks in it, to try to cover Duffy's tracks in particular. To, to, to start tampering around with an audit, whereas the whole purpose of bringing in an audit is to be able to say, and to be able to say with justice, an independent body with, you know, a professional integrity has looked at these books and has come to these conclusions. And if they were simply a yet another political prop, that's very disturbing. It would be interesting also to hear him answer the question why one amount was okay to pay and a little <laughs> bit more, or a lot more, yes. was not okay to pay. You were still paying something. Uh, Bruce, uh, on a witness? Well, I would say that uh, Senator uh, Marjorie LeBreton, as well as uh, Mr. Duffy, um, would be interesting to listen to. I agree about Irving Gerstein. Uh, I think that what they all speak to, though, is this larger question. This is a government that is extraordinarily disciplined as a political entity about not leaking, about not showing their inner workings, not letting people kind of inside the sausage making. And this trial, uh, among other harms that it will do to this government, will expose a lot of conversations, a lot of exchanges of information, and the intent uh, and the nature of those conversations uh, will be embarrassing for the government. I know that... Um, these still aren't, at the end of the day, for many Canadians, the most important issues of all, but they will be distracting um, from the government's other agenda. And I think that, well, we can look at important policy changes like um, tax-free savings accounts that the government was talking about today. Those may end up being one-day stories. This will end up being a story that's uh, very prominent for a considerable period of time. All right, I've got 10 seconds left, Jennifer. Um, it's a trial just by judge, no jury there. Yes. You were yes. watching that judge. Yeah. <laughs> How attentive did he look on this? Very, extremely attentive, and he, he took a lot of notes. And he was very accommodating of the media. Uh, they've, they've, you know, given us a lot of leeway. We're allowed to tweet. Um, but yes, he was very attentive and, um, you know, gave them time. I mean, the defense lawyer went on for 90 minutes or so. So um, that was, uh, you know, I, I, I'm assuming that he's going to get r r way down into the weeds like the rest of us will. Clearly, that he's attentive to the media is one of the most important things. <laughs> Self-interest <laughs> <you>. there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Thanks, Jennifer, uh, filling in uh, this week for us, and we'll be watching the trial closely. Bruce uh, in Ottawa, Andrew here in Toronto.